We're good. Ready. Uh, do you want to give uh, the date and location? And... Uh, I don't know the date. It's January 2013. Uh, and we're now... The 23rd, maybe? Maybe 24th? 24. 24. Right. And we're in an apartment in downtown uh, Washington. Yeah, we have a um, short-term rental in an apartment because our house is rented out because we've been traveling. We, my wife and I, have been traveling in the Mediterranean Sea on our sailboat and exploring the ancient world. And we're so, in between. Uh, so we come Turkey. back for we come back for the winter time and uh, see family and do whatever we have to do. So could you give some uh, background on uh, what, uh, in terms of your life, and what do you think were the key elements of getting you involved in social justice work? Well, I grew up in a political family. Um, my mom and my dad were first generation here. Um, my dad was fairly conservative. Uh, his family came over from uh, Ukraine, and they were draft dodgers. They were fleeing the czar. The Tsar was recruiting anybody he could to fight the Japanese, and he really didn't care if the Jews or the Japanese got killed. In the, so they came over as teenagers. My mom's family uh, fled Poland for the same reason, and they moved to um, Nebraska. And my mom actually came to Washington to see what Jews looked like. She was a very curious person. How did she get, uh, just curious, how did she get as a Jewish immigrant to Nebraska of all the places? The B'nai sent them there when they had landed here. And I think they had a major headquarters there, but there wasn't a big Jewish community. And it turned out all of her uh, three other sisters moved to the Washington area. Hmm. Whoa. Yeah. And just a little sideline, although you don't think it's significant, you were sent to an Orthodox Jewish school when you... Well, yeah, because learning the culture was very important. My mom came to Washington also to work for the FDR administration. She, she wanted to be where the action was in the, in the 30s. And, and your in dad? The social justice. My dad uh, and his brother uh, moved, moved to Washington, to, uh, and they both became lawyers. My dad did not practice. He was a criminal lawyer for a while, and he said, I saw innocent men go to jail and guilty men go free, and he was quite disillusioned with the system of justice. But they brought you up with a strong sense of social justice. Yeah, they always rooted for the Democrats. Uh, my mom was a socialist at heart, but the, the socialist wasn't going to win in the, in the party. She was the, the active one politically. And we would go door to door as a little kid. We'd go knocking on doors to get petitions to get vote, voting rights for D.C. What and, year? Oh, probably, I was probably doing that when I was six, so that would have been 1949, wow. 50, right? And then uh, going to the Hebrew Academy, we'd go to door to door trying to raise money to plant trees in Israel. And, and I was kind of... Uh, disheartened. A few years ago, there was a, a Palestinian that cut down a tree and got shot by an Israeli. And I thought, man, I hope that tree that I raised money for wasn't that tree. <laughs> I'm curious, since we're about the same age, do you have any memory of the Army McCarthy hearings on television? Yeah, yeah. Um, we didn't have a television at the time, even though my dad worked at Sears then, selling televisions. But uh, we would go to the neighbors to watch those and I thought, is this the way grown-ups act? It, was just, it just didn't hit me. It wasn't, obviously, it wasn't entertainment. It was serious business, but it just seemed so, so bitter and nasty, as a, as impressions as a kid. Mm -hmm. So uh, you went to college here? I went to, uh, went to public school and then Howard University. And when I went to university, I didn't really know what I wanted to study, whether it's going to be art or science, because I had a passion for both. And finally I decided I'd rather have somebody teaching me the science than teaching me the art. And Howard was cheap and local, and I wasn't the best student in the world, and their, their standard to get in was uh, um, enough that, that I could get in, and you take these tests, and you know, 
I, I later found out I got 100% on the math test, and, uh, and I studied physics there, and that was great. But when I got there, kids were coming back from voter registration in Mississippi, and this was like a whole new world that opened up. 63? 64? Uh, I was uh, graduating in 62, took a year off, uh, with going in, I think, 63. When you went to? I went, I went to summer school first, because I wasn't sure how I'd fit in in this black community. <laughs> that was kind of funny. I was a little bit apprehensive, and I went into the student union there and looked around, figured, well, I'll talk to somebody. And there was this good-looking black woman sitting alone. So I said, you mind if I join you? And we're talking, and so uh, finally she says, I'm so glad you came and sat with me because she said, I'm, I'm from Texas, and I've never been around so many black people in my life. <laughs> she was always around white people. Now, so you, that kind of broke the ice psychologically for me. I said, oh, okay, every, you know, everybody's the same that way. When you went to school here, did you go to segregated schools or were they integrated uh, in schools? In 1954, the schools integrated. We were living at 4th and Decatur Street. And I was very aware of this practice called block busting. And they're saying, well, you're, and you know, when, they, when they, the schools integrated, a couple of black kids came into school. Well, I don't know how many, I wasn't, you know, counting. But the real estate people would make sure they sold a, um, a black family a house on the block, and then they go up and down the block and say, you better sell your house real quick because the neighborhood's going to turn black. And uh, my liberal parents moved to Chevy Chase, D.C. Mm. Uh, their main thing was uh, to get into better schools. It was, uh, Lafayette, Alice Dio, Wilson, which were the top schools in the day. And it was close to my dad's work, which was Sears, which was on Wisconsin Avenue. So it worked out. My mom didn't drive, so I was near bus lines too, and she was a great walker. So the social justice um, introduction, did that come at Howard? It really got uh, kind of a new chapter. When I was at, um, at Wilson High School, there were three black kids, and one of the three... Six, Sixty. One. Uh, I graduated in uh, 61, yeah. but there were, one of the uh, black kids there lived near me and, and he became my best buddy. We were, you know, we were inseparable. And I'd have to go with him down to where Ben's Chili Bowl is now so he could get a haircut. That kind of thing. It was a segregated city. And, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, I mean, I had the theory, having grown up at Second and Upshur in the old soldier's home, there were people who were lame and, you know, and I just always got to talk, you know, I got to learn that, well, just because somebody is different, they're not bad. And, you know, I just kind of grew up with that idea. And, you know, we went to school with people from all around the world. But so and, first involved in but, social but the, justice. The, the idea of activism first came with voter registration with my mom. And she was always politically active. She was, you know, League of Women Voters, and uh, and there wouldn't be a week that she would write a postcard and send it to some congressman telling them what to do. So she was your inspiration in terms yeah, of Yeah, 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 for sure. Well, and I went to Howard, and then these other people came back from Mississippi, and, and they played good music, had good music, and I played a little banjo. And, and uh, there were also a lot of creative people there, and I was always hanging out in the art department doing sculpture as well as in the physics. In the physics department, there wasn't much politics at all. Um, it was just, you know, learn physics. I said, I'm going to give myself a year to decide on whether I should register as a conscientious objector. And I had read books like The Effects of Nuclear Weapons. And I, I anticipated going into physics, and everybody in that day was gearing up for the Cold War. It was all, you know, all the science was geared up for killing the Russians. And so on my 19th birthday, I went down and registered as a conscientious objector. This predates Vietnam, but I just said, I, philosophically, I said, you know, war just isn't right. And then I went to Howard, and they have required ROTC. So we were in a little bit of a conflict, uh, and I put it off and put it off and put it off, and finally, 
they say, take it or you're out of here. And the dean called me in and uh, he said, we don't like you white guys coming in here and causing this kind of trouble. We were beholden to the federal government. And I said, well, you know, my conscience is my conscience. So I got a letter kicking me out and then I went to the ACLU and it's the same lawyers there doing the civil rights work that quietly let me back in again. <laughs> and so... Ralph Temple. And I started a peace club there. What year do you remember? I don't remember what year. It was pretty early on. Probably... 63. Probably 63, yeah. And it was interesting. There, there was this one guy who had been in the Army and he carried on his back when he was in the Army a rocket that could send a missile a rocket uh, half a mile with an atomic warhead. He said the last thing we want to do <laughs> is send an atomic weapon to, to explode a half a mile away because you're going to get hit by that weapon. He was in that peace group. And, it <laughs> and there was an interesting group of people that were, you know, there. So, so your first involvement, actually, seems early to me, was peace rather than civil rights. It was, yeah, it was uh, taking a st stance against, an you know, being in the army. Hmm. Which was an immediate threat, possibly. Well, at the time, Vietnam wasn't even talked about. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember Vietnam until no. 64. Yeah. Think yeah. of China. And, and, you know, if you were a student, <clears throat> Uh, for a long time, while well, students didn't get drafted, but pretty soon they did start giving numbers to everybody. And so, so what led into uh, the activism that got you involved in starting the Free Press? Well, uh, one day General Hershey, who was in charge of the Selective Service, was speaking at George Washington University. So I said, well, let me go over and see what's going on. Because these people at Howard didn't know about the draft. They were into civil rights or being very bourgeois and ignoring civil rights completely. And while I was over there, I spotted another white guy from Howard, Frank Speltz. And I knew Frank. Uh, and we got together and went over to Tasso's bar afterwards. And, and we're talking, we're going, you know, the kids at Howard don't know anything about the draft. And then the kids at GW don't know anything about the civil rights movement. Why don't we start an intercollegiate newspaper just to kind of spread the word? And uh, six nineteen sixty four. Um, possibly, possibly. Um, and so we so we figured out how to do it. We said, well, let's get two kids from each of the six universities. It was Catholic, Howard, American U, GW, Georgetown, uh, and Maryland University. We figure, well, okay, we'll have 12 people and put a, we'll put out some kind of newspaper. And, uh, Do you remember any of the other kids? Outside? Sure. Uh, for all, Frank and I. Um, Dick Oaks from Maryland. Another, so my ex-roommate. Yeah. Uh, Sheila Ryan was at, um, it wasn't Catholic, it was Trinity College. Uh, Gabe Huck. If I, if I if I could look on our on the in the paper and just list the names because we're all in there. Uh, so we did. We put out four issues, and it was an intercollegiate newspaper. It wasn't we weren't thinking underground newspaper at the time. Just you know, and you know, I went to Tony Gittins, uh, who was working on the hilltop, and and, uh, and I knew his good friend Woody because uh, he played the guitar and making a lot of good music and. And I said, you got to show us, how, to, how do you put a newspaper together? And he showed us all the things we did. We, we just did all the things we had to do, the nuts and bolts, to get a paper out. We solicited people for contributions, and we got a $100 contribution from one of the professors at uh, Howard. And that was like, that was enough to keep us going. We had a couple parties, fundraising parties. And, uh, and we put out those four issues the first year, and then uh, school ended. And we were glad we didn't have to publish anymore, because it was a lot of work doing that. And then we said, we'll start up again uh, next year, when school starts. So we came in March, and so March to June, I think it was. So 65. Jar March 66 was the first 66, issue, yeah. 
And, uh, and then by, by that time, the word was out that we were doing this newspaper and other people came with their contributions. Our policy was it's open, uh, open to all points of view. We even had a chess column for a while because there was this guy, Art Sweeney at DuPont Circle, who was the chess champion of the city and he would just play. Was there a commonality since Dick was involved in SDS? Uh, was there was there SDS? I think it predates SDS. I'm not sure of that, but I think it may predate SDS. Well, SDS. Prior to the paper, I had worked for Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Oh, okay. I was in '64 and went to um, Atlantic City, where the convention was. To and all I did was, you know, I mean, I was in so many marches in this area, protesting this, that, and the other. And, Slumlords. There was a lot of activity at Howard that was locally uh, done, including something a couple blocks from here. There was a slumlord on Fairmont Street, or Fairmont or Gerard, I can't think of it right now. Uh, there was a big protest. Well, Bruce to, Terrace. To boycott uh, him. Bruce Terrace was organizing the whole thing on and, and, you know, I, so I knew, I knew a lot of people from. Uh, from the movement, the civil rights movement at, uh, at Howard. And that's when we realized we didn't know anybody at the white universities doing anything. People who came to work for the newspaper had their own agenda. We had communists of all different shades. And I remember once the newspaper got rolling, uh, we almost, the newspaper almost ceased to exist over whether we would accept a Coca-Cola ad or not. And of course, Coke didn't even know we existed, <laughs> but we argued for two days. And finally... This was the beginning of the free press. This was, as the free press was ongoing, the second, the second year... 66. Uh, you're asking me dates, and that's hard. I have to look, okay. at, the, I have to look at the paper, and then I would know. But the, 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 the arguments were based on whether you were a Maoist or a Leninist or, you know, I don't think we had any Stalinists there. <laughs> and, uh, and then people, it, people gravitated towards the paper. Everybody had their own agenda and everybody was well respected. And the way we ran it is everybody had to take responsibility. So every six months you'd have to take your hat off and take a new job. So, you know, um, one year I even did the books, which uh, I learned, you know, I just learned how to track everything to the penny, which is not who I am. I'm more of a, of a nuts and bolts type guy. Make sure that if something has to happen, it's going to come together. I'm not a writer. Uh, I had no interest in writing, but I knew where, I knew where the news was because I was a news junkie. But you were operating as a collective from the beginning, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. We didn't call ourselves that. But in effect, that's what it was. Were people also, were there living arrangements in which people were also living we collectively? Moved, or? We, to, to make it work, at the, at the time as a student, I was driving a cab. And uh, my friend Frank was also driving a cab. And he had a wife, and he had adopted a, a child. You had a job with the Bureau of Social Science Research. That's no. not right. No, no, I okay. I had a job okay. with the Bureau of Social Science. Because I remember getting a job with somebody. I thought it was you. No, uh, it was no, first I, job. I've mine. never had a job. I had a job for six months in my life once. And that was that it. That was it, taxi <laughs> cab driving. No, no, that was my own business, though. For $300, I put myself behind my own cab. And it was a great way of making a living because you could just cruise the streets with your girlfriend, broke pick up somebody, take them somewhere, pick up somebody else, take them somewhere, and then go out to dinner. <laughs> or go to a movie, you can do anything. But In this semi collective So we, we, no. we, we moved into a house collectively on Q Street, and that became our first office. Q and? 1727 or 37 Q. And, and we even recruited the woman who lived in the basement apartment who wasn't part of this group. She ended up, Carla, uh, uh, ended up uh, working for us. And uh, she was an artist. Working, I, I say working for us, but working with us as part of the newspaper. It was always uh, kind of a group effort. Anybody had anything to contribute? 
had a pretty good chance of getting it in. How often did you meet when you when you formed this the semi collective or oh, every day? Every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every day there was something that needed doing. And what was the schedule in terms of getting out the paper? What when was it? I had certain goals. Everybody had different goals. In my mind, I wanted the paper to be a weekly. Sometimes we achieved that, sometimes we didn't. And, and I thought, I'll know we're a viable paper if one day I'm on the street and there's one blowing down the street. That's what I looked for. Just like the post or the star or the news. I wanted to see. And one day it happened. <laughs> one day there was a free press just being you know, on the street. It had been discarded. And I thought, okay, we've arrived. Uh, any idea about circulation at this point? Uh, I say release I, 66, 67. I think that our circulation was usually, I think our first issues were 10,000. And then, because once you print the first one, it's cheap for the rest. It's just a matter of physically handling. And I think, and I'm not sure if I'm right or not on this, but 30,000 seemed like a very regular number. Uh, that we would print. I'm pretty confident of that. And somehow I think there was, there was 100,000, but I'm not sure that that's right. I think that's probably just bad, bad memory. How did you handle distribution of that many? Well, this John Hagerhorst walked in one day and he said, you guys need somebody for distribution. He had a truck. John's a good friend of mine. He's still around. He's an artist, a writer, uh, lives out in Frederick. And he took care of distribution uh, in terms of physically, uh, and um, we, I think, and we did two things. Uh, if he came in, the, the the paper sold for twenty cents, and so people could come in and buy as many papers as they want for ten cents, and then they sell them on the street for twenty. It was a good way of making a living, and that's how we made most of our spending money. We paid ourselves $30 a week, but selling the free press on the street was the way you gathered news, you found, you know, you made contacts, you were out there, and it was good money to be made. It's, a, you know, 10 cents at a time. And people in terms of advertising? The advertisers were uh, the hip, the, I'd say the hippie shops eventually. Maggie's Farm and places like um, Toast and The head Starbucks, shops, yeah. uh, the bars, but the big ads were the record companies. Because you could sell a full page ad to a record company and I think it, I think maybe we were charging $300, but that would put color in the pages. That would pay for, to get color. And it was interesting that I think somebody did some research, but uh, I think the government figured that out, and they went to the record companies and said, don't advertise in these papers. By the government, you mean? The federal government. FBI? Well, I don't know. I didn't do the research, and somebody told me they read that in a book somewhere. And, and I think abruptly, those full-page ads did stop at some mm -hmm. point. Do you remember what years we're talking about here? Well, you asked me what year, mm -hmm. and, and I won't be able to... Uh, I'd have to look at the papers and then they can just see when they, when they cease. Yeah. But that, those were big bucks that stopped.